My name is Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg. Uncle Dave Cooper is the guy uh, under the hot lights, man, for the shoot interview today. Jimmy, rattle off a little of that bibliography, man. We're going to go into some things. Man, a renaissance guy, cartoonist animator, uh, video maker, oil painter, and exceptional at all of these things. Uh, got on my radar with Weasel in the late 90s, early 2000s, completely blew my mind. One of the most beautiful comics still to this day that I've ever seen. Uh, Ripple, one of his animation is Pig, Goat, Banana, Cricket. Um, Eddie Table, Absence of Eddie Table, another of his animated videos. He's been doing oil paintings and showing them in LA, uh, New York, Paris, uh, and Pillowy, his big art retrospective, just came out uh, a little over a year ago. So Dave Cooper, man, making all kinds of art and blowing my eyeballs away with it. Worked worked for a, a tr trilogy of the most uh, important uh, comics publishers by, by our lights. And <laughs> yes, we are talking about Aircell, North Star, and Fantagraphics. You can't disable the power of the label. Uncle, Uncle Dave, th thanks for coming by, man. Oh, thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. So, Love you guys. So the Cartoonist Kayfabe channel, uh, we, we built it at the beginning upon uh, Wizard Magazine. And uh, when, I, when I was a kid grabbing these wizards, there was this incredible oasis in the midst of all that nonsense called Palmer's Picks. That's where right. I discovered your work, man. It was, it was uh, revolutionary to me. Never saw color like that. I think it was early. It was early. It was like Suckle and... and the, you know those those early fantagraphics comics here's the here's the opening question in the midst of those 1990s man how the heck does an independent cartoonist keep their head above water during that time mm -hmm. oh my god yeah i was in a very generous relationship at that time i have to admit like i was basically allowed to do my own thing my uh, wife at the time who i've separated from um was so supportive like she worked uh she worked a day job and she just encouraged me to do my own thing and then at one point um we were living in an apartment and her dad started getting elderly and she thought it would be a good idea for us to move into his house and i was like damn that could be a really great way to just like produce tons of work and not have to worry about income you know so a lot of that stuff, a lot of weasel was done during that period. So thank you to my ex. Well, you mentioned weasel and uh, we'll probably jump around in time a little bit because I have questions about your comics before weasel. Yeah. But weasel is when I first discovered your work. I, I got it at the end of, um, you know, every year the comics journal would have their best of the year. And they'd ask different pros about, you know, give us your top comics of the year. And everybody like unanimously was singing the praises of weasel. So I run to the comic shop after that and I track it down. And rightfully so. I think I read an interview with you where you talked about comics wise, you were unhappy with how the comics career was going and you just sort of hit bottom and said, I'm going to make the comic I want to make. And that's Weasel. Is that a true story? Because I can't find where I think I read it. But yeah, I don't know. That doesn't sound that doesn't feel right to me because, you know, I'd, I had done a bunch of stuff that I was really happy with. I might have been talking about like pre fanographics. Um, so, you know, I did Suckle, um, Dan and Larry, Crumple before Weasel. And I think before all those, I was like, not really, I didn't really know who I was, what I wanted to be. I, I just like, at an early age, decided that I was going to be an artist. And um, at a way too early age, I became kind of a hack. Like the work that I did was just done so fast and so thoughtlessly and um it wasn't until I started discovering underground comics that I realized what an artist is supposed to be. It's not like just a producer of content. You're actually are looking for things about yourself that you want to express, you know? Um, and at that same, like I was discovering underground comics and like the films of Jad uh, Alexandro Jodorowsky and Lynch. And it was just like the perfect timing for me. I, my mind exploded and like, I realized what, what kind of artist I wanted to be, Dave? Let's let's talk about those uh, early uh, two two young uh, days, man. We're talking Air Cell Comics, Barry Blair Publisher, Gun Fury, Icarus. How old were you when you were making that stuff? Uh, so probably something like seventeen, eighteen. It's incredible. Like I quit high school. Um, not that I was participating particularly to begin with but um at one point I just gave up and I was like I'm not 
I can't do high school. And I, I accepted this job with this guy that I knew from an earlier life and uh, just started working full time doing comics. And, uh, you know, I was really into it, but I, like I said, I just didn't really have a, a voice yet. I didn't know what I was doing. Like I was just kind of doing whatever um, work was assigned to me and sort of like, Jake Thrash was a little like Blade Runner because I loved Blade Runner. And it was just like very genre stuff that that didn't resonate with me particularly, I guess. I was revisiting a bunch of that stuff uh, in prep for, for our conversation. And it's still so unique. It's, it's funny to hear you say that like you didn't have your voice or anything like that because there was a voice there. And when we chart your career, it does feel like there are several periods and then like the, the, the painting stuff that feels like that came out of left field. Like just like what's, what's the in-between stage there. But uh, looking at the early, the air cell comics, um, Von Baudet came to mind, you know, mm. like, like bubbly yeah, yeah. lettering kind of like bubbly characters, but not, you know, those weird lizards or anything. Was, was he uh, an influence? Like huge, huge influence. Yeah. Okay. Like in the early days, it was just uh, Bode, uh, Mobius, Sergio Aragones. Um, and, you know, maybe I'm too hard on myself. Like I, I, I look back on those, those things and I'm so like, like, I don't even, I haven't read them in decades because I just don't really even want to go there. You know, they have like other sort of negative connotations with my personal life and stuff like that. Um, but it's interesting to hear that you think that there was some kind of voice there that's kind of encouraging. Like when, when I met you guys in uh, South Carolina, maybe. North um, Carolina. Carolina. And uh, <laughs> like I was at a very low ebb at that time. I was, I was going through like a kind of a depression, depressive period, I guess. All my work like didn't feel good and didn't feel right. I was like low self-esteem. And I go to this convention and you guys really built me up talking about that old stuff. I was like, at first I thought you were pulling my leg. Like uh, I had, I didn't know anybody liked or remembered any of that stuff. So it was a, it was a really good con for me meeting you guys and like Andy Belanger and just kind of like give me a little bit of a foot up. I got to mention that, that festival real quick, because that, that was, that was a very important moment for me. I think it might've been, important. I don't want to speak for you, Jimmy, but, <laughs> but here's to the people at home. This is how it played out, man. We had a dinner set up. The great Shelton Drum, who, who runs that festival, you know, pulled out the black Amex card or whatever, man, took us to dinner. <laughs> and uh, I'm there, Jim's there, Tom's there, uh, Ben Mara's there. One side of the table, Uncle Dave Cooper. Other side of the table, Uncle Jaime Hernandez. Now, me and the bros, like, we didn't say anything to each other, but we were communicating with our eyeballs. And I think what we were <laughs> communicating with, Jimmy, you know, if I'm wrong, let me know. But the look that I saw in your eyes, the look I saw in Tom's eyes, it was like we're like, I think we're in comics now. Oh, <laughs> it nice. didn't feel like we had arrived. Yes. Yeah. Did you ever have a moment like that, Dave, where where uh, you know you bumped into somebody, you you had a conversation with somebody, and you're like, I think I'm in comics at this point. Yeah, I, I remember it very clearly. It was uh, I think I was promoting Suckle, and like it was the very first con of any kind that I've ever done and it was uh, San Diego San Diego con I forget what year but I was so nervous like red-faced you know like tongue-tied and uh finally I get up the nerve to go into the into the hall and the first thing I see is Mike Mignola's desk and I'm like holy shit so I go over and I I say hey I'm Dave Cooper I did this book suckle maybe I, I might have given him a copy or something he's like, he's like I already have that man and he, like shook my hand he's like you know like totally building me up it was awesome have you continued a relationship with mike mignola i ask because you know in the backup in one of the weasel issues he contributes a really interesting short story yeah very cool i mean that was so nice of him to do that to sort of like give me a little bit of press and stuff um yeah we're still friends uh, on facebook i don't really talk to him outside of especially with the pandemic you know i don't see him too much i saw him at uh <laughs> at that uh, Heroes Con, it was interesting. I remember because I was like at such a weird, like super emotional period, <laughs> I, I bumped into him in the bar and I started chatting with him. It was just the two of us. And at one point he's like, 
wow, you really like to talk about real stuff, huh? <laughs> like, oh man, I got to chill out a bit with the emotions. Do you draw uh, influence from his artwork? I think I do like in, in like very sort of um, peripheral ways. Like I don't think our styles really, um, I mean, they're so dissimilar. But there are certain things that Mike does that definitely like click in what I'm drawing, you know, and it's, it's stuff that's really hard to explain. I remember he talked about um, being a visual development guy on a Disney film and basically being flown in and, and being given the task to like explain to all these designers how he draws and what, you know, how he sees things and, and talking about how that was kind of impossible. You just have to demonstrate like there's, a weird way that he he creates volume with so little like it i don't like people people um mimic him and it works but before that i don't think anybody really did what mike does you know like just a, a weird line creates like a bizarre sort of like everything of his is sort of crushed and impact like contracted but it's it's all done so simply it's just like brilliant yeah, it's very different than your art, but I think of both of you as being extremely stylistic uh, yeah. in your own ways, but that's not true of a lot of cartoonists or comic book artists. So it's, it's something that stands out, you know, you make a list right. of stylists and uh, I think you'd- I think I, I take things list. like, you know, I take things from people like Mike and um, John Kay and people that, my, that I'm not super similar to, but I sort of like see little aspects that I like and they, and they get absorbed. I hate to keep going back to air cell. I, I was just thinking to say, <laughs> whatever you want, man. Um, what was that environment like? Was there a like an oh, office yeah. where you went and worked together, or were you freelancing and just working? I don't know, in, in you know, in the basement or in your bedroom. Yeah, in the beginning, I was in the basement of my my parents' house, um, and then at some point, Barry got um, big funding, or they got some kind of grant from the government or something. Like Barry was Barry worked at a an insulation company. And they had this real douchey boss. Um, and I guess the business started going bankrupt or whatever. And Barry was like, well, why don't we like start up a comic book company? I know all these comic book artists. So they rented a house, just like a, uh, um, a residential home in downtown Ottawa. And uh, so every story had like artist studios in it and a like photocopier machine and uh I guess a kitchen and Barry was on the top, like, you know, the King. And it was just, uh, it was just a mess of like, like none of us had any experience with the um, arts community or any kind of business or, you know, animation companies or comic book companies. We were just like individuals and we all had our own weird quirks and, Somehow we all, like some people worked really late and some people were always, um, you know, coming in late on deadlines. And it was just like a lot of different personalities and like a real mishmash of things. Can we talk about a couple of those personalities to see if any of those names connect? Uh, because there were some, some very interesting artists that came through there, you know, yourself included, but names like uh, Dale Keown, one yeah. of the guys I dug a whole lot, uh, he didn't do so much work as do Jim Somerville. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool stuff. Who's that Warlock five guy? Dennis, Dennis B we'll call him. Cause he has a French. Uh, Boivin. Say it. Yes. Denny Boivin. Bo oh, sorry. Denny Boivin, I think. Yeah. See, well, I'm in the United States. We can't say that kind of, <laughs> kind of, you know. but I uh, did, did you have connections with, with, with these guys? Cause like to, to me, they're, they're top talents. Like there was Guang Yap too. Guang and, Yap. Uh, yeah. Patrick McEwen. Mm -hmm. Um, those are the only ones that come to mind, but yeah, we were all hanging out and going for lunch together. And, uh, <laughs> I haven't seen Jim in decades. I don't know what happened to him. Uh, Dale, I'm still in touch with like on Facebook. He was never a very social guy. Like he's, he's a bit of an introvert. Um, but he was interesting cause he was, uh, God, did he play bass guitar before becoming a comic book artist? He was like touring in a, in a glam, like a, kind of a glam metal band, I guess. And he played bass incredibly, right? And uh, he was like the first big success story that any of us had ever experienced, you know, where like 
we're all working away and and I personally I didn't really think about like this going anywhere or leading to anything and then he he did that the Hulk and then the, the image thing and we were like holy shit Dale is rich like legitimately rich and we'd go visit him in Toronto and he had this fucking like mansion with all these empty rooms you know <laughs> and uh, sweet guy like just so generous you know he, he he'd always welcome us but um and then patrick he was my best friend from like when we were probably like 11 or 12 here in ottawa at uh much more elementary school i used to be like the shit as far as you know like the class artist and then patrick comes to town and i'm like oh boy damn it <laughs> like, i have to share this title or he's going to take over like the guy could draw at such an early age in such a advanced way you know so he went on to become a, like a real fine artist and uh, a professor i think at concordia so he doesn't do i don't think he does comics or animation anymore um guang i think is maybe like a animation director um anybody else the dennis guy yes oh Den yeah. denny um i never even met denny he was kind of like he had sort of a reputation for being like <laughs> you know the the hot shit that nobody knew about or talked about i think he didn't even live in ottawa like he might have just um sent his stuff in from montreal or something did, did, Barry, talented guy. did barry blair discover all of you guys at the same time at like one fateful comic convention or like i don't even know actually how he discovered the other guys but he met uh patrick and i when we were like kids and uh you know he was <laughs> this is probably like for another time but um yeah he was he was kind of predatory in a way so um i that's why i have like really really um complicated mixed feelings about that whole time you know because he uh, he had been kind of a, a dick earlier um, in my relationship with him. And then I came back to work for him because I had basically, I mean, almost blocked out things from, from the past. And I was just like, damn, cool. I can be a comic book artist, you know? And I just like jumped right into it. Um, but then, you know, over time, I maybe the company died or something it's scary to think that I could have actually stuck around but anyway for whatever reason I, I ended up elsewhere and I that's when I started like really pushing instead of having this this like teat feeding me constantly with income I had to like start thinking about what do I actually want to do with comics you know and I spent a few years sort of like fumbling around not really very successfully and and then that period happened you know like several years later where i started to get a clue about you know what i what i am what i need to do you detail uh well i don't know about detail but dan and larry is sort of i, I think you've described it as being allegorical about your experience working with with uh blair yeah and i, I it makes me wonder like del keown's pit book which was his image publication was about this monster character and a little boy and their connection. And, you know, as an outsider that doesn't know much, I see some parallels between Pitt right, and Larry. Right. I, and I wondered if you saw that. I didn't. And probably because I know there was, there was no correlation. Like um, I, I honestly don't remember how he met Dale, but it was definitely like well past all that stuff. So Barry was kind of behaving himself at that time. <laughs> and, and Dale was a grown man. So He's, you know, not as easy to take advantage of. So after you bounce from from uh, that company, take a little detour through uh, through North Star, uh, the Outlaw Comics oh publisher. Oh man, I almost <laughs> forgot about that. So we got to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> well, good thing you're here today. <laughs> North Star. I'm trying to remember, like puke and explode. Yeah. And uh, one of the things that comes to mind is, uh, man, in those 1990s, I remember renting two VHS tapes just for the trailers carnosaur three because it had a trailer for the roger corman fantastic four movie i don't remember what the other video tape that i uh rented that was a sony picture classic joint 
but it had a trailer for the Crumb documentary. And in that trailer, he's pulling up, he's in the comic shop, pulls up a copy of Puke and Explode. Puke and Explode, this comic's called Puke and Explode. Don Donahue, publisher of Zap Comics, says, you know, you're kind of responsible for that. Uh, tongue in cheek, you know, uh, Robert Crumb looks at him, puts the comic down. I don't want to take credit for this kind of stuff. <laughs> you, you see that. What happens, man? What, I didn't know that was what, in the trailer. That's kind of cool. It's in the trailer. Yeah. So, so what's the reaction when you see that? Hmm. I mean, I think I just convinced myself to feel that it was a cool thing to be in there and just that he touched one of my comics. It, it, uh, what, do you, what do you think of Robert Crumb to start, I guess, man? Oh. You hold him in uh, reverence? Genius. Yeah. He's one of the tops for me. And, you know, he's left like an indelible impression on my work for sure. Uh, but I mean, I don't even like that comic that I did. So why, <laughs> why would I expect him to like it? You know, uh, you know, like I, I realize it's kind of embarrassing. People have said in the past, like, oh, that must be so hard that he did that to you. And I'm, it didn't really occur to me at the time. I was just like, hey, I was in the Crumb documentary. <laughs> yeah, I would think that shit was cool, man. Yeah, any press is good press, right? I mean, it's <laughs> it's funny. Like like the, the guy who's just talking about making comics with incest and stuff is like, oh, I, this is too much for me. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. fucking punk rock, dude. <laughs> I remember coming out of the theater, actually, and my ex-wife being like, well, I mean, they chose to pick up your comic, so there must have been something there. <laughs> I'm like, okay. I'll take it. <laughs> that was cool stuff. Like, like we're starting to see. I mean, even in the earlier days, we started to see your practical color on the covers, and that is even more painterly. You know, I, I'm assuming blue line method. We'll, we, we can talk about that in a second. But there's also that lettering style, that like twisty, curly right. lettering style that you were developing. Uh, that just once again, like you said, you were like searching for your voice. Maybe the, is that on the road of, to discovery? Because I mean, nobody. Yeah, I mean, that stuff. In the, certainly in the sense that I I'm the type of person who has to just try a million things. So at the time, that was like super important to me. All the lettering had to be like so. Blah, 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 blah. And now when I look at it, I'm just like, holy shit, what are you doing? Like, it's just, you're just supposed to read the fucking thing and look at the picture, you know. But it's like I have this thing about me. Maybe less so now, but. At the time, it's like I needed to somehow distinguish myself in every area, you know, like I was just trying so hard. So, uh, yeah, it's hard to look at now, but <laughs> it makes perfect sense when you explain that that idea of like wanting to distinguish your work in every way that you can, uh, you know, experimenting like you needing to just try these different things to kind of work out how to do it or what works yeah. for you. And yet that's not how every cartoonist works. You know, part of the reason that, that we found your work in those back issue bins is because you did that and other comic books did not look that way. Um, right. you know, it may not be what you arrived at, but it definitely showed this artist who was like thirsty and hungry, right. just trying and going for it. And uh, yeah, I mean, at the same time that I, I don't like looking at it, I, I feel proud that I went through all that stuff. You know, it was like a journey I had to be on to in order to get where I wanted to be. You know, I didn't know then what what I what kind of artist I should be or what kind of things I need to express. So I was just like rooting around. How would the color be accomplished for for a cover like you can explode and some of that other stuff? What was it a blue line? process no no that was like, like uh that would uh, i think that i would start with a with a pencil drawing and then do like uh watercolor or gouache um washes like really sort of hazy washes and then i'd sort of uh establish things a little bit and maybe i was using markers at that time too shit actually now that i think of that maybe puke can explode was markers but anyway, the whole, like all those, all those uh, media that I was using markers and watercolor and gouache and acrylic were basically me not knowing that I should be using oils. <laughs> so like now that I'm in oil, I, I can do all that stuff that I was trying so hard to do with like um, inferior tools and methods. What, what, but yeah, what, it was, it was like just creating washes with, um, with uh, markers and then I think I would ink it afterwards so, so to like to clean clean things up and then I'd put all these white highlights all over it. like I was insane about the white highlights at that time 
you know, I'm still still on the the black and white tip a little bit because uh, we just never had this conversation before. Um, look, looking at those comics, I wonder uh, the the washes that that and the tones that were were uh, applied to them. Was it ink wash? Because there's a part of me that thought that maybe these pages could be in color and it just got turned into, you know, a black and white image. You're talking about um, like Puke and Explode and uh, uh, like Earth like uh, Icarus, like 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 any of that stuff that yeah. had the. Uh, I think that was markers. I think uh, Icarus was markers. I remember we at the the air cell that um, residential home that we had our office in. Right next door was an art store. And uh, we had like, we all had um, accounts where we could just go in and get anything we wanted. And we'd have like fucking huge stacks of uh, Pantone markers. And they used to have this airbrush thing that everybody liked where you put the marker into the blow in the air compressor. And uh, so the whole fucking house smelled like Pantone markers and everybody was half baked all the time. I guess um, were, were you using colored marker markers on your pages, or you knew it was going to gray? No, it was gray tone. Yeah, it was, I think they might have had a range of like ten grays, and there was even one that didn't have any um, pigment in it. It was just the gasoline or whatever alcohol, <laughs> and whatever. that with that thing was just to like blend one into the other. So it was like soaked with chemicals. So still in the nineties. You end up doing a couple of things I'm curious about. One is, were you a letterer for Dark Horse Comics? Mm. Yeah, that was um, that was uh, an interesting time where I started to realize, like, I started to figure out that you have to you have to find other ways to make income other than underground comics. So I had my my wife who was um, supporting us overall, but then I was I also had like you know the drive to try and make income too. So I think that started because I was I was uh, doing short stories for Fantagraphics and Kim Thompson was my contact there and like super, super sweet, nurturing person. Um, and I don't know who suggested it, but he was eventually like I this I was going to be lettering this Mobius graphic novel. And I was like, wow, Mobius, I can't believe it. So I, I did it all like super old school just on like tracing paper in little squares like so I'd have a whole sheet of paper that just had like nothing but word balloons with little numbers and then I would send it in and like you know somebody in the somebody who knew about computers <laughs> would would drop the ball in and uh and then I I kind of um used my experience doing that to get some work on like dark horse comics where the money was better I you know I still remember the amount that I got was $616. And to this day, that number pops up on, on uh, like digital clocks all the time. I'm always seeing 616. It was like this big game changer for me that I could actually make $616 a month. And it just kept coming. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. And it gave me plenty of time to work on my own stuff too. So is this where you would be like wood shedding your 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 painting technique because at, at the beginning like I was talking like how it just seemed like it came out of left field like like we you, you could watch your evolution as a as an artist and then you start to see the color creep in with like the puke and explode cover and and and, and some of that stuff and then it's just like you you arrived there's you know there's suckle and and stuff like it but like you really figured that out in a way where it it, it felt instant it felt abrupt or something where yeah. you were this way and then you were that way so i'm imagining there must have been a lot of secret stuff that you just kind of kept to yourself or how did that play out well i think um that was like around the time that we decided to move into my ex's father's house <laughs> so i had a lot of time or i had you know like less stress is what i'm saying uh, and i'd wanted to be a painter for decades like i always sort of dreamt about it and i'd say i'm going to be a painter one day and I worked on like watercolors and gouaches and acrylics and um, and then one day I decided to try oil and I worked on this big canvas and it was like kind of a rough drawing but I just I just had this attitude about me that like I'm gonna 
I'm just going to do this. I'm not going to care about technique. I'm like, because something that stopped me from trying oil for so long was this idea that it's complicated and like there's thinner and there's medium and you have to do this and you have to do that. And it's like, it's really not that important. It's just goo that you slosh around on canvas and do whatever you need to, to get it looking right. You know? Um, so I did this one painting that uh, I'm still kind of proud of in a way it's not the greatest painting but it has like this this sort of brutal energy to it like the strokes are confident and I think that just changed everything for me I was like this is this really is something I can do I can I can learn to paint and make big paintings and and it was around that time that I decided to do weasel and the thing with weasel is that I wanted to like somehow gather all my interests and just squash them into this one thing so that I would have like um, justification for doing all this stuff. Like I, I sort of like created a um, deadline for myself to make an oil painting for every issues cover. You know, I guess I took like all the paintings that I, all the oil paintings that I had done as covers and used them as a way to sort of um, get some galleries interested in doing like uh, group shows with me and stuff like that. And that I started really pushing with, uh, with the paintings. Did you find those paintings, you were able to express something that you couldn't do in say the pen and ink drawings of your comics? Yeah, for sure. Like there's something so lurid and like sensual about color and like all those thick strokes of paint and like the way things blend, like with oil paint, nothing blends like oil paint. It's like, that was one of the things that turned me on so much about that first try was just like completely effortlessly, I'm blending two colors and creating this other super sophisticated tone. You know, it's like, it happens all the time with oil paint. If, if you're not too like, if you don't overdo it too much and it turns to mud, you can get all these really interesting colors from like, if there's a red, and a green and an orange, and then you just kind of like, swoop them all together a little bit. They just like become very, uh, very distinct and subtle colors. Did you have a, like a network of other painters that you were talking to and, and or, or looking at that, you know, pulled you in, in the direction that you went? No, I can't think of any, like I would, you know, observe people's work. Like uh, Mark Ryden was a huge influence and like a big inspiration. Um, and I looked at a lot of old painters. Uh, I guess I would, I would look at juxtapose, you know, trying to imagine like, how could I make a career out of this and trying to like figure out how I could fit into that kind of scene. But um, no, I've never been, I've never had like a ton of colleagues that I chat with. It's, it's a lot of it just happens with me sort of like rooting around, like I said before, just like a pig looking for truffles or something. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned juxtapose and uh, I was going to mention, um, you know, comics and painting. Robert Williams comes to mind, the creator of Juxtapose magazine. Uh, did you have some relationship uh, with Robert Williams in any capacity? A lot of comments. You know, I think I met him a couple of times, but um, never really uh, st struck up a good conversation with him. But man, He's, he's done so much in that field. It's incredible. He says you're not a real painter if you don't stretch your own canvases. Do you agree? Uh, I disagree, but <laughs> by his definition, I am a real painter. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm, like, I don't give a shit how you make your work. If it, if it touches me, if it expresses something, then that's great. But he's, he's like old school macho. You know, he probably like works on his own cars and shit like that. He was, he was, uh, no, it was Coop. We were talking to Coop and uh, he said that Robert Williams came to him and was like, you're inking with a pen. Like uh, only hacks ink with pens. You gotta learn, <laughs> you gotta learn how to use a brush boy. <laughs> <laughs> and then he started to use a brush. And I think that like he used the wrong brush and, and <laughs> he was like, no, nah, that's not the right brush. That's fine. Can't please this guy, so many <laughs> rules. Dave, the other thing I was going to ask you about in the 90s is um, I think you worked on designs for Futurama for Matt Groening. Mm -hmm. 
I, I'm curious how that came about and was animation like a field you were looking at, you know, kind of like with painting is like, you know, is this a career or how do you do this? Can you tell us about your animation experience early on? Like uh, until that experience, I'm, I'm pretty sure that I was not interested in animation. Like I liked it as a viewer and I, but I thought like, I thought animation meant being an animator, you know, like being that guy that does a million fucking drawings and, that I, that's just like a nightmare to me. I couldn't imagine wanting to do that, you know? Um, so what happened was uh, I, I was having a signing for Suckle that same year that I met um, Mignola and like everybody else, all my, all my colleagues in, in comics at that time. And uh, Matt Groening came to one of my signings and, you know, I recognized him right away. And I was like, holy shit. And he got me to sign his copy of Suckle. And he, and he said very mysteriously, um, someone's going to be contacting you. Uh, someone named uh, Jason's going to be calling you about a, a, a project. I was like, oh, okay. So like we exchanged numbers and stuff. And um, I go back to Ottawa, like just buzzing, like what the hell is going on? You know, this, it could be like, I, I always think big. So I, I figured it was going to be something amazing. You know, um, I think I had to call them after a couple months to remind them and, uh, um so yeah they just wanted me to do some visual development work on their pitch like before they before the show actually got picked up they needed to create a pitch for fox so i did a bunch of um backgrounds and vehicles and i think they liked them uh and then when the show went into production they offered to have me on as a designer and didn't really work out like with my schedule so um, that was kind of the end of that but then later, uh, a couple of years after that, that producer that I was in touch with, Jason, um, stopped being a producer. And, and uh, I think I might have been one of his first clients as, a, as an agent. So he's been my agent ever since. So that, that's another cool thing that came out of that gig. So fascinating to think of the way Hollywood works, like Matt Groening, most successful television series on that network, still has to pitch it. You know, you hear those stories about yeah. Steve Spielberg too, man. Like, still has to pitch his ideas. Yeah, it's hard to believe. <laughs> a lot of money involved in that game. I guess it makes sense. And they still have to make all kinds of compromises to, like, you know, people above who have some fucking stupid idea. <laughs> <laughs> we were talking about uh, pens and brushes a minute ago. And I have to share this story. I, I've told it a million times to people, but the first time I interacted with you, Dave, I don't, I'd be curious if you have any memory of this is I reached out to ask you about your lettering on Weasel. And uh, I believe you said it was all done with a Hunt 102, like the whole, basically that whole book. Is this, and, a, is this by uh, post? Uh, email, probably. Um, okay. Probably email. And uh, you were very generous, you know, responded, answered my questions about tools. You know, in my mind, I was still looking for this magic tool. Like, how, how does Dave Cooper make these great drawings? He's got to have a special pen, a, a brush, some secret. And uh you know, you responded that it was a Hunt 102, which completely deflated me because then it's like, well, I guess there isn't a magic pen. I've used a Hunt 102. But I, I remember it always stuck with me, just this idea of like, one, there is no magic tool and that it's clearly, it's the artist that is creating this look, you know, like I, I'm sure, because then you go into pencil, you go into painting, you do right. all these different tools. Clearly it's not the tool, but that always stuck with me as like, you know, the, the simplest tool that every cartoonist does use at some point, and yet what you're able to do with that, how far you can push that tool and its limits, uh, it was pretty extraordinary at the time, but the feedback as well, you know, like in my mind, you were this published artist, busy cartoonist, successful, and you still had time for this nobody who's emailing, you know, trying to like pull some secret out of you. And you had time for that. It all, always, uh, I still, I still love, like, I've always loved um, those kinds of questions. I'm just like, I'm not a nerd about movies or books or film, movies are film, um, <laughs> but uh, like art stuff, tools. I'm, I'm really into that. And I love like when younger kids contact me and they don't have a clue and I can just give them some little, you know, germ of information that can just like blossom into some, new direction for them but yeah, yeah i loved i loved the hunt 102 back then i was just like literally in love with it i just was like oh my god you can letter you can do thin lines and big fat lines and i used to buy like a dozen of them and and test each one because there were always i think there was a 
like a pretty small percentage that were actually perfect. And then some of them had like a, a burr that would like scratch into the paper and shit. Um, but yeah, I love that. But then at some point I got so like, I have a problem where I become too sort of um, particular and like things have to be exactly right. And it's really, it doesn't serve my work well. Like usually my work is best when I'm just learning how to do something and it's kind of clunky and doesn't, um, isn't like super refined. So I felt like I had got to the point where it was so refined. I, I was like, I don't know how to explain it. It's like, I'm getting and trying too hard to get everything exactly right. And it's like, there's no sort of like spontaneity. Um, so I kind of gave up on ink for quite a while and just started using a pencil on uh, Yupo paper, which is like a very, very nice buttery surface to draw on with graphite. Yeah, cre creamy was the word I was thinking of when you say buttery. Um, yeah. It feels like that's moving closer to the painting, you know, that sensual quality that you have in your painting. Yeah. I feel like that that pencil line has a little bit more of that quality than the, uh, you know. What I, I think what I, what I was starting to crave was like not only uh, variation in line, but variation in tone. So with the graphite, it looks almost exactly like an ink pen when you draw on uh, Yupo, but you can like get slightly lighter lines as well. So it, it sort of opened up my vocabulary a little bit. You talk about your dad uh, for a second. Like, is, is this the studio that you're in where he created that kind of like mechanism where you could stack up your paintings and- it's Oh, I did that. Oh, you created you might be that? Think, you might be thinking of the- um, the, the, ba the back support thing? The, the Verta table. I was I was going to bring a horizontal table. Sorry, <laughs> I was going to bring that up too. Uh, explain to the people at home what the horizontal table is, and I think unless you uh, deleted your Flickr account, uh, they're going to be able to find uh, some visual aids for that. Yeah, I haven't I haven't seen that in ages, but it, it's probably still up there somewhere. Uh, so I was having like when my first son was born, my my back went out. I think it was probably stress related, but like completely fucked my back because I couldn't barely walked to the washroom for like two weeks and like I'm still working on it now it's 18 years later but it's like I feel like it's about 95 percent there um so when my at that time I, my mom and dad were both living in Honduras they had retired and sailed down there and built a house my dad is like super super um handy like he can make anything you know so when he when he comes up to visit he would always like ask if anybody needed you know, stuff done or anything built or whatever. And um, so I started having this idea because I, to relieve, like the only thing that would relieve my back was to lay on my stomach, like, you know, with, with my head in my, in my hands kind of thing. And uh, so I started thinking about this contraption that I could build where I would be in that position and then have like a little support for my forehead and have like my arms be able to go under the support thing and have my drawing surface there. And, and it all, it all sounded like really good in, in theory. And he made the prototype and um, it kind of worked, but basically I, I just realized that it wouldn't be realistic to <laughs> lie down there with my head on a thing for like hours and hours. So we kind of gave up on it, but I still have that, thing and it's it's just a testament to like how my dad expressed his love you know, he would he would want to make things for people all the time so so you fabricated this the uh the thing that's hold that holds your canvases what do, do you have yeah. a name for that like did you ever see this thing jim I, I have yeah i have seen that i just called it the hanging mechanism it's right there actually i thought that's what that might be yeah it's just a way to like i work on a when things are, are really going for me, like I'll, I'll be working on maybe a dozen paintings at once and none of them are in a rush. It's like, I just want to pull one out and work on it till it feels like I'm not sure what to do next. And then I, I what I used to do was, um, I mean, I'd have to let it try and then I would roll it up and put it in a closet and there'd be like a closet full of paintings. And um, so I came up with this idea instead where I would have all, have paintings stapled onto, <laughs> that bar mm -hmm. you can see there that that one's stapled on there but i could actually get two or three sometimes and then that bar can be removed and i take it into another room and it hangs 
to like store and I can have like three or four bars like that. So like a dozen paintings. And then whenever I want to work on one of them, I just pull it out and put it on the thing. And it also like by this, this thing, it can, these pegs, it can like be lowered to that peg or that peg. So it makes it so that I don't have to like bend down or like stand on a stool or whatever. It's really incredible, man, because it's it's like it creates a very small footprint for what could be yeah. giant heaps and gobs and stacks. Yeah, and the inconvenience of the um, drying time of the oil too is like this. This makes that uh, irrelevant because it can just hang up wet. It doesn't. Have, I don't have to wait for it to dry before I can roll it up. Was there a, a watershed kind of uh, art show you participated in that that really helped? Uh, you know, push the painting career along? Well, they were all, like, they all felt important at the time because, uh, like, each paint, each show that I would do would be, like, the biggest show I've ever done, you know? So, like, the first one, I think it was in, uh, I always forget, it was either in my friend's video store where we put up, like, 15 paintings, like, little paintings, or it was my other friend's uh, art supply store. And uh, both of those shows, I was just like, this is it. Like, I'm, I'm selling a $500 painting. I'm like, I've made it, you know? And then the next show was um, in Pittsburgh. No, Philadelphia, um, where Tin Man Alley used to be, the Jonathan Levine Gallery. And uh, I think it was a three-person show. And again, it was like, holy shit, like, I made it. Uh, you know, I'm selling my work for... 1200 bucks or 2000 bucks or something. And like the guitarist from tool called me that he wants to, you know, own one of my paintings. And it's just like, holy shit. But then the next one maybe was uh, La Luz de Jesus. And then it was Jonathan Levine had moved to New York city. So he had a much bigger gallery. And then it was back to LA for um, the Billy Shire gallery. So everything was like escalating and my paintings were getting bigger and I was getting more money and I felt like really on top of the world you know and that's when uh, the 2007 recession happened and just like completely popped my bubble it was so shocking because I just made like the biggest body of work of the largest paintings that I'd ever done and it's just like so uh, confident you know that people were gonna dig them and uh, then it just became irrelevant. Like nobody had, nobody was buying for like two or three years, probably. Dave, you mentioned the um, the economic downturn in like 07 affecting your paintings, uh, where you were in your career with painting. Is that what starts pushing you into animation to get into like uh, pig, goat, banana, cricket? Is that whenever the, the yeah, scene of that begins? Absolutely. Yeah, it, it impacted my income and also my like, it was just heart heartbreaking you know like I, I couldn't believe that I, I kind of took it personally like I didn't understand finance well enough I guess to just be like well it's just the way it is I was like it just crushed me that people weren't buying my work you know it was bizarre um so anyway I I saw that there, there was no there were no buyers anymore so I was just like you know, people over the years, animation, people would call me and, and offer me stuff or, or suggest things. And I'd always be like, no, no, it's cool. I'm, I'm a fine artist. I'm, you know, thanks anyway. And then when this happened, I was just like, okay, I'm just going to say yes to whatever happens next, you know? So I got a call from uh, Audrey Deal at uh, Nickelodeon. She was a development producer and she asked me if I wanted to pitch something. And I was like, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so I started like scrambling for ideas. I think even like a couple weeks later, another producer called and, and asked to um, option my kid's book and make a TV show out of that. And I was like, yes, let's do it. So the for like four, four or five years, there was this bizarre thing where I had these two things in development and they were kind of like reaching the same milestones at around the same time. So like I'm negotiating the contract for both going into like development for both. Um, and then they got picked up really close to each other. So I was like blown away, you know, like I remember talking to people before the pickups and just being like, you know, sounding like 
everybody else who's got stuff in development, you know, I got these two things in development and it's like, Oh yeah, I'm sure. You know, like everybody has things in development. And then when they both got picked up, I was just like, fuck, what the hell? Like, how do I even do this? A wealth of um, opportunity. So one, I had to, um, I had to completely step back from, I had, because Nickelodeon insisted that I was exclusive to them. So I had to go to the other production and be like, I, I can't even continue helping. But at that point, we sort of done a lot of the development and um, they were able to continue with the show pretty well. Um, mimicking my style and like the the mood that I wanted to achieve and stuff like that. How does Johnny Ryan factor into uh, pig, goat, banana, cricket? Well, like I've always, whenever I work in television, I always need to work with a writer because I like, I enjoy writing weirdo, nonsensical stuff that's like creepy and weird. But when I think about like television, like episodic television and, and appealing to like a mass audience, I have no clue. Like I don't, I just don't know how to do that. And I don't really want to learn. I figured like maybe someone else will do that. So I, <laughs> I thought it would be fun to choose somebody that was so outside of, <laughs> so outside of um, the mainstream and outside of television and all that stuff. So and I always found Johnny's comedy like completely hilarious. And we had done a couple of um, all ages cartoons for Nick magazine, coincidentally, like years prior. And I was always struck at how he could, like it didn't seem like he was toning things down or, or speaking down to the audience. He just had like this really outrageous, nonsensical sense of humor but instead of like his usual work, that's about like dicks and puke and whatever it was, you know, about other stuff that, that kids find funny. So uh, for better or for worse, um, I, I got them to, they, they wanted like experienced TV writers and stuff. And, and I looked at a bunch of their tryouts and, and it's just hard to like judge um, mainstream screenplays because it's like if they're really good most of the time it means they're sort of like land and just like i don't know they just all felt kind of average and so i kept pushing to have this this bizarro guy and they knew him too like the the people a lot of the people in development and television have like really bizarre tastes as well you know like so so they know about all of these guys they just don't normally hire them so uh eventually they they gave in and decided to let him come on he's such a fun cartoonist <laughs> always glad to have uh, some johnny ryan reference come up in one of these videos you would hear about like the old conversations that matt groening and gary panter would have before they you know became who they were and how they wanted to like infiltrate pop culture and I feel like that's what you and Johnny Ryan did with that thing. That like little did the parents know who were like <laughs> sitting their kids down in front of the TV to watch this stuff. Like uh, you're going to be able to find more of those guys works. Man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like that was so awesome. I mean, those guys made uh, incredible work that's going to really withstand the test of time. But uh, I'm not sure that uh, Johnny and I <laughs> achieved that. So. Not yet. Still work in progress. Um, you mentioned a little bit about your writing process, Dave. Can you talk more about that? Like how, what is the process for writing a comic or a graphic novel for you? Um, I don't know if it's normal. It's probably pretty typical, but I spend most of my time just like daydreaming when I'm doing other stuff. And then like, if if something really, for me, it's always about like moments, like little moments that I think, oh fuck, I, I would love to see that, you know? So I write it down or I message it to myself. And then like over long periods, I'll, I'll go to messenger and like select it all and print it out. So I end up with like stacks of these disconnected moments, like whether it's one sentence or a paragraph or whatever. And at, over time, I'll start to like imagine connections and maybe there's like recurring, um, archetypes and they start to develop into actual individual characters and um so right now for instance i have a, a, a an idea for a feature film in my head like i think i might try my first screenplay at some point 
but it's, I haven't even started actually structuring it or writing it, but in my head, I sort of understand the structure of it. And then in my notes, I've got like all these moments. So that's how I, that's basically how I have done like all my work. Um, aside from Eddie table, which are mostly pretty, um, verbatim dream sequences. Dave, like your comic scripts, are they, uh, is it words and pictures or are you writing yourself uh, essentially a movie script to then? Turn I never write, I never doodle in, like I'll doodle separately, but when I'm writing, I don't really include doodles as part of that. Um, uh, yeah, I, I don't write it out like a proper script that someone you give to somebody to read. It's more like just notes and like words and and like everything else is happening in my head already. So it's basically just like little um, little triggers for me to know what to draw and where. And then I just like break it up into panels and pages and figure out, you know, where it's all gonna go. But the actual, like this, the screenplay that I'm writing is, is gonna be different. Of course, I have to actually write it. And um, it's like, writing's always been a weird thing for me. I, I sort of love it, but I, would do anything to avoid it. Like, I don't want to, it's painful. <laughs> like, like before the pandemic, I, I wrote this um, lecture because we were going to Singapore to a writer's festival. So I had to write. So I, like a month before the festival, I said, okay, I'm going to sit down at 9 a.m. and I'm going to write till noon, no matter what. And, and given that kind of um, structure, I kind of got to enjoy it, you know, like you're forced to be in that mind space and you have to make progress. But um, I have gotten to the point where I just don't wanna do that really. So I, it's, it's, it has to be a project that I want so badly in order to put me into that position, you know? I remember that kind of uh, energy when it came to like drawing comics early on where I always describe it as like you have to just like develop patience muscles uh my first couple pages it's like you could easily see the panels that I didn't want to be drawing I wanted to get to <laughs> oh, like yeah. cool stuff and I wonder if if the writing process is kind of like that way if you just sit down long enough you start to develop uh, yeah more and more patience with the whole process I'm sure I'm sure that's what it is and I feel like there's probably a writer in me but um it's sad that he probably won't ever get fully <laughs> realized because I have all these other things I want to do you know it's like I'm kind of uh it kind of makes me crazy sometimes thinking of like all the different projects that I want to get done and they're all sort of like big things so I've gotten to the point now where I I am thinking about my own mortality <laughs> like how many can I actually bring to fruition you know that's what I always love about your work, your whole career. Been following it since, since for well for a long time because I don't like to. I had somebody tell me that uh, they've been checking out my stuff since they were a kid, and I didn't <laughs> like that feeling. Uh, uh, but you 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 will do a lot of things. You'll try a lot of stuff. You'll you'll play around with style when when you're comfortable over here. Now you're painting and and having shows that way. Uh, yeah, but you do have to choose, man. You do have to, mm -hmm. you know, well, having, yeah, having a million ideas is as bad as having zero ideas sometimes. It really is. And it's gotten worse. Like, I feel like I'm almost paralyzed. Like, I, uh, the last couple of days is a good example. Like, one day I'm thinking so excitedly about, like, I want to do a preschool show. And I've got like, the characters designed and it's like, this is the most important thing in the world to me. I'm going to do this, you know? And the next day I'm like, I wake up and I'm thinking about um, how I want to do a mini opera <laughs> with like these, these deities that I created. The God is, maybe you've seen them in my paintings or whatever, but the God is like this big hairy guy with big antlers and he's got one big long dick for a head and then one big long dick for his dick and on the end of each dick is like an eyeball so that's god and then there's a, a little devil that's like a bird character and there's an adam and eve and everything and i just uh since the pandemic i've been focusing a lot on my music like uh, i'm a drummer but i also started like learning garage band and like composing music out of like um, field recordings and stuff like that and just really really getting into it so I've been thinking about like how can I how can I combine my music like 
bizarro music, bizarro characters and like maybe dance and singing and maybe have like little animated segments. And, and it's just like, this is the kind of thing that you would want to, like you would want to have just this one interest, you know, and for a whole couple of years, maybe three years, only think about this one thing. And it's like, all my work kind of suffers because I don't, each, each one of those projects needs that amount of attention, you know? So instead I'm like chipping away at this, chipping away at that chip. And then maybe like several years from now, one might get crapped out. It's frustrating. Has that, has that been your career? Like, are there always like lots of irons in the fire and then ultimately there are, but they, they seem to like get bigger and more um, ambitious with time. So like, with Weasel, Weasel was a good example because it was like, I actually, those were all my interests at that time, you know, and I was able to put them all together you know, with like the style of Eddie and the style of Ripple and the paintings on the cover and using like interesting design elements around this, around the spines of the books and stuff like that. And uh, I even had like little sketch sections. So it was like, super satisfying that I was able to express all these different facets of me but now it's like um it's really grown so that I have like television is like this whole section where I would like to do this kind of tv show and I want to do this kind of tv show and there's a film I want to do and then there's like live action that I'm I'm getting into as well so um it's just weird it's hard to like imagine how I can how I'm going to be able to get it all done I have to just focus on one at a time every now and again so that it gets sort of like pushed up to the top do you have any standard like uh like a standard work week or what what, what is that like are you working virtually the whole time you're awake what, what's your what's that part like um no I try to keep things pretty conventional that way like I'm generally around nine to five because I like to um I like to mimic my partner's schedule so that we don't end up on like that weird cartoonist schedule where like I'm going to bed when she's getting up or whatever it is, you know? So even if I'm really feeling it, I try to end at around five or six and just like in, enjoy a nice evening and try to go to bed at a reasonable hour. It sounds boring, but like I've found that if you're, if I'm personally like super inspired and I'm like, I'm going to work till midnight or one. And then the next day you're like, you've kind of, you're at a, you have a deficit. So it's like, it just kind of shuffles everything around too much. I'd rather go to bed, um, not having expressed everything, but then wake up, you know, like excited to get back to it. So I'm, I'm, I'm down here with my drum set. I work, I probably drum for about 30 or 40 minutes a day. I paint a little bit. I draw a little bit. I'm back into uh, visual development right now too, for like some of the major um, studios. So I'm doing that and, and just developing all these ideas in little fits and stretches. I think that having a regular schedule is one of those things that, um, people dream about not doing that whenever they, they become <laughs> artists or they quit their day jobs or whatever. And it's something that I've certainly found I need to, and it's exactly what yeah. you describe. You know, you, you, you put in that 15 hour day and you do pay for it, you know, the next day or the day after. So it all kind of evens out. Uh, but I know I've thought myself about it over the years and the regular schedule certainly is a, uh, a useful tool, much like a deadline. Yeah. I'll get I there. think like going to bed <laughs> is a big thing, you, you know, eventually, you yeah. know, like if you don't end up going to bed with your mate, it kind of throws off your personal life. And, and that's a big part of being an artist too. Like you want to have um, harmony in your, in your personal life, but having talked to so many artists, I'm curious, like, is, is it as common as everybody imagines that artists have like bizarre schedules or, or do you talk to more people who, who uh, prefer like a routine? I think uh, older artists and, and artists that have family or kids or stuff, they, they find that routine. And some of it is probably external. If the kid's going to school, you sort of have to be awake to, mm -hmm. you know, get them off or get them home or have dinner or yeah. stuff like that. So I think the having a family, we often see schedules, people adopting schedules for that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, <clears throat> I think like part of the job is like just allowing yourself to like follow like where things go. So 
you know, you, I think there's room for like mania and pursuing mm. mania, you know, like, and if you do want to, you know, that day where you do spend 15 hours and get like no sleep and then you're dead the next day, you might get some really cool stuff out of that, that just, you wouldn't have gotten otherwise. So like, but, but yeah, yeah. You keep, keep this stuff in, in, in balance. <laughs> like, like I, I live what you described, yeah. but by verbalizing that to do with schedules, that, that's almost like enabler talk. <laughs> like, right. yeah. like, like now everybody's going to be furious and fucking working 30 hours. We're, we're all enablers. Like I want, <laughs> I want you guys to push yourselves to the limits because I'm going to see what comes out. You know, <laughs> I got my own reasons. Like I, I want the work. You, know? you got some more stuff, Jimmy? Uh, I did want to talk a little bit about Eddie Table. Um, you know, that's a character I really fell in love with in those backups in Weasel. And then you make the uh, absence of Eddie Table, you know, short animated film uh, video. I'm not sure how to describe that, but that feels very different, you know, very different than, than say the animation that you've done with Nickelodeon. Um, yeah. How does that come about? Is that a different team? Is that a team outside of like that? Element? Yeah, totally different. Yeah, it was. Um, so I visited uh, Oslo for a comics festival and um, I ended up having lunch with this really great um, CG um, film director. And uh, he, was, he was just like, you know, I love your stuff. I'd love to collaborate on something really, really bizarre. And we were talking about doing something like super avant-garde. And, um, but in the back of my mind, I was like, I had this idea for an Eddie short and I wasn't sure if this was, this was going to be the right guy for it, you know? So I, kind of waffled for a while and um but then after sort of communicating with him long distance for quite a while i realized that i wanted to you know offer it to him and he he really really loved it so <clears throat> the whole thing happened pretty fast where he got a norwegian producer involved and and like super professional guy and he got a grant almost right away for like a quarter of a million dollars so um we we just jumped right into it and the you know like they I always wanted to do the film like 2D like traditional line art and like a little bit rough looking and they were they really pushed me to try to put him into the world of my oil paintings like super rich colors and like lush 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 and uh I was like okay and you know in retrospect it was completely the right decision it's I, I love the look of it you know um, and they got the, the composer and like the guy who was in charge of doing the backgrounds turned out to be this super hardworking, like ingenious guy. So everything turned out amazing. And the composer knew, um, is a frequent um, collaborator with uh, Mike Patton, the singer. So um, they worked out this deal where they uh, well, he, he basically suggested to Mike, like, would you, t would you consider doing the voice of Eddie in exchange for us taking the video once it's done and just recutting it and letting you use it for like one of your music videos. So that was kind of a cool thing to have in the film too. And the video turned out great too. Like I actually like the video as much as the film, but you know, in two different, totally different ways. It's really cool to be bartering uh, on that scale, you know, like bartering yeah. your, your, your video, your animation like that. How hands-on were you for that? for you know producing that video is that something that they would just show you things and you'd be like that looks great or the the film or the music video the, the film. film uh yeah it was i was hands-on i did lots of like prelim preliminary designs and uh, i was always in contact with the guys and they they um brought me out to oslo like two or three times to spend a week or so just like you know getting to know the animators and um giving any notes I could think of and doing further like sketches. So I designed, I would design all the, all the plants that they, like they basically made these huge forests, but based on maybe like 20 or 30 little designs that I created. And then they like multiply them in really weird, interesting ways. So yeah, I felt pretty, uh, I mean, Runa was really, the director Runa was really the star of that show though. I mean, he, he, he made it happen and and as much as the budget sounds great we we blew it pretty quick and everybody was working for nothing for quite a while because they were completely uh they, you know they didn't want to um they didn't want it to go out uh, you know other than any way that, other than perfect so they just kept working and working until it was right 
has that led to anything? Is there, is there a, do you plan to do another project with that team or? Uh, I don't know if, if Runa really wants to work with me again. Like that was, that was, that was a lot for him. You know, he, I mean, anyway, I shouldn't say that we haven't, we haven't talked about, um, working together again. Um, I, the, I'm working on a, a short Eddie film, uh, that I'm going to hopefully, um, execute in the way that I talked about, like super rough, like line art, no color, like the backgrounds are just going to look like my, my sketchy, um, inky, uh, line drawings. And, um, so I'm going to do that, but, uh, yeah, I don't think, uh, I don't know if I'll be working uh, with Runa again. We'll see. It's interesting whenever we think about how much different work you've done and it feels like, you know, you do something new and then you learn something from it and it applies to then like the next new thing or the next direction, yeah. maybe the next body of work that you create. Um, it's, it's definitely an unusual path based on artists that we've talked to. Uh, none spring to mind that work or, or produce the type of work that, that you have done over your career. I, uh, I mean, I, when I, when we did the Eddie film, for instance, I was so blown away. I was just like, I don't know what, like where this is, where this is going to go. You know, like, and I had, you know, friends around me saying like, this is going to lead somewhere. And it just doesn't, it never goes where you think it's going to go or as quickly. It's like always very circuitous. But um, I think that uh, part of the reason I'm I'm doing all this work in in visual development right now is is due to Eddie, you know, like just the fact that they could see that I could imagine this whole like totally realized world. So that's kind of cool because that's an area that I've always um, fantasized about. Like when people talk about being a visual development artist and and features, I'm just like, whoa, that that would, that must be so fun. Like you just you're just coming up with like your vision of what things might look like, you know? And uh, when I started doing it, it's like, this is just as cool as I imagined. I actually <laughs> love this. This is so much fun. So I was thinking, uh, I think I think I know the way to bookend this conversation and, and, and wrap it up in a bun. We began the conversation, brought up Wizard Magazine, <laughs> that, that, that uh, speculator boom and how that Palmer's Picks was the oasis in the middle of that very crappy magazine that would often show off cool Fantagraphics comics it's where I discovered Dave's work, put a name, put a, put a face to the name kind of. Uh, here's how we'll get out of it, man. Because there was a very small window of time when Fantagraphics would come to Pittsburgh for the Pittsburgh Comic-Con. And uh, it was on the strength of, I think the Harvey Awards came mm -hmm. those years yeah. and can't disable the power of the label, the Fantagraphics artists, Chris Ware, Klaus, Dave Cooper. They're the ones winning all, all, all the Harveys and stuff like that. And I think you were in town for, for one of those, man. Now that idea of Fantagraphics being at the Pittsburgh Comic-Con is an oasis <laughs> in the middle of a whole, a whole lot of nonsense. And uh, just imagining uh, Fantagraphics. I mean, I the only interaction I ever had with Kim Thompson was at the <laughs> Pittsburgh Comic Con, and he breathed fire in my face <laughs> because he was so mad about stuff. And I wonder, D Dave, were you in uh, Pittsburgh for those awards? And if so, uh, what do you remember? I have very vague memory of Pittsburgh. Like when you said that, I had to I had to think about it for a second. And uh, what I remember, I don't think I went to the awards show. At least I don't remember doing that. I remember signing. Um, but I was actually traveling with a journalist. There was a, there was a Canadian uh, writer who was shadowing me during that whole thing to write an article about me for um, a Canadian magazine. So I was uh, like, I, especially back then, I had a lot of trouble with interviews. Like they're still a little bit iffy for me, but Back then, it was just weird to to be like shadowed by this guy the whole time, going out for dinner with him. He's always constantly like trying to drag stuff out of me, and like I'm just not a great communicator, so it was a little awkward. But uh, I remember driving into Pittsburgh; it seemed like a very interesting city. 
that was the Harvey Awards where Frank Miller's ripping up Wizard magazine. Yes, right. Yeah. And and the one thing that I do remember because I was just a little kid in the back, you know, they would let the rubes come in and stuff. You get to sit in the back, and Chris Ware won for best coloring. And believe it or not, this is how long Rusty Brown was going on. Unless unless there was some major snow sequences in, in Jimmy Corrigan, which I don't think there were. I think it was a Rusty Brown panel in the 90s. Uh, they're showing the nominees for best colorist and they show a Rusty Brown panel, I think, with just one colored character in a, amongst white <laughs> and everybody <laughs> was laughing at him. <laughs> you know, everybody was laughing at it and, and it ultimately won. And what would happen, it was real cool because because Gary, like none of those guys were coming to Pittsburgh. Like, it was real cool that you, that you came to town. But those other dudes, Chris Ware ain't coming to Pittsburgh. You know, Dan Klaus ain't coming to Pittsburgh. Uh, so it would just be Gary and Kim like collecting these <laughs> trophies like that, man. Uh, but, you know, just to give the people at home some sense of uh, what the what the crowd was like, you know, they're, they're clowning Chris Ware because to them color means you got to use all 64 colors in the crayon box or something. <laughs> yeah, where's the gradients? How come there's no purple to orange? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Ra- radio uh, radio yeah. gradient. Yes. Oh, man, I'm good. Yes, that, that's fantastic. Dave, such a pleasure, man. Is there anything uh, on the horizon that you would like to promote or any social media where people could check out your stuff? Well, you can. Uh, my Instagram is uh, Dave Cooper 67 That's pretty much where I post everything. So, um, yeah, if you're in Madrid, there's a show going on right now that you can where you can check out the biggest painting I've ever done. You can see that on Instagram. Can I show my book? Please. Yes. This is my book that came out uh, probably like the same week as the pandemic. So uh, <laughs> I had all kinds of book releases, um, signings lined up and they all got canceled. And uh, it's, I'm so proud of this book. Like it, it turned out to be probably the most beautiful, like as far as production, how things uh, turned out is just like exactly how I would have hoped. It's 400 pages of like basically every piece that I still like. So going back all the way to 96, some, some things that I still like from back then. And it's all my fine art and all my commercial art and like interesting stuff from TV and film and everything like that. So for the audio podcast listener, this is pillowy, the art of Dave Cooper. Yeah. By uh, Sarnunos, Sarnunos press. I was going to ask who the publisher was, man. It's a real sexy package. Yeah. yeah it's, a, it's a, it's an incredible uh, publisher. Um, this guy, Rodolphe, uh, La Shah. Um, I met him uh, up in Angoulême, like for my first Angoulême, like 20, 20 years ago, maybe, where I had this big retrospective. And uh, he, uh, he contacted me like just a few years ago about this book. And he said he's been thinking about my work ever since that opening. So <laughs> it's kind of a nice um, turnaround. You're about to say something? Oh, yeah. Yeah. When you were talking about like your mortality and also, and then talking about like having a bunch of different projects going and wondering like, you know, what form they're going to take, if they're going to take fruition. It is kind of like, you know, for all of us, it's like, well, there's a comforting thought that at some point you're, you're going to die and there's going to be this amazing art book that's going to have all those <laughs> little bits and pieces that like you never figured out what to do with. So yeah, you know, yeah. you, that's, that's like volume one in the series. Yeah. Hopefully that doesn't happen for a while, Tom. <laughs> super cool dave thank, thanks so much for for coming to uh chat with us on the channel and uh it was awesome to speak to you and also to let you know that it was the dinner that we had with you and uncle jaime hernandez that let us know that we're officially in, in comic books you made it yeah thanks a lot for having me guys i, I really had fun and uh, i appreciate it